Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we have Professor Jason Bromley from UT. He's going to join us and talk about sort of uh, the way we're going to do this, I think, is we're going to do like maybe 30 minutes. I need to put a cell phone out here to time myself. Uh, we're going to do like 30 minutes of me doing more of a historical overview, and then Jason's going to jump into his research. And then we're going to open the rest of it up to Q&A. Um, but I'm going to have him start by talking uh, a little bit about this picture, and then uh, we're going to kill it so you don't have to look at it the whole time. Because I, I imagine for some of you it will cause uh, motion sickness or something. Uh, yeah, just wanted to get this picture up there since the title of the uh, event is about mission accomplished 15 years later. What are we referring to with that? Uh, so it's actually May 1st, 2003, that uh, President George W. Bush flew in to the aircraft carrier of the USS Abraham Lincoln and declared that major combat operations in Iraq had concluded and uh, the U.S. had been successful. And th behind him was the Mission Accomplished banner, which in years later would be the fodder of many late night comedians and political science professors across the country. Um, although in my remarks, I want to say that it's not, I think we should, we can reflect on this mission accomplished PR event, this spectacle in a broader historical context, not so much as a gotcha moment about Bush and his, or his administration's hubris at the time, but as indicative of a larger pattern in which US administrations, really from both parties, and for generations have misjudged the costs of wars that they've committed the country to. Um, just one final thing about this before we put the, put the photo away. Uh, given that he was talking about Iraq and that he flew into the aircraft carrier on a fighter jet, sort of Top Gun style, like he was, um, was Tom Cruise or maybe Goose, uh, one might think that this event took place in the Persian Gulf, like near, near Iraq, near Kuwait, near Saudi Arabia, somewhere in the Middle East. Uh, it actually took place off the coast of California, so off the coast of San Diego. So this was uh, very much a kind of local um, US planned, US staged event uh, to, to cap the first uh, five weeks of the Iraq war and sort of put a bow on it. Also, that same day, May 1st, 2003, the uh, major combat operations in Afghanistan were declared to have ended. Wow. <laughs> so, yeah, so two wars concluded on May 1st, 2003. Yeah. That's amazing. All right, so... I don't know if I made this happen yet. Yeah, I did. All right, so what I want to do is I want to do a little bit of historical overview and for those of you who have had me before, which I think is almost everybody in here, um, I, I have to go back a little bit. Um, so <clears throat> um, part of this conflict, of course, is the relationship between Iraq and Kuwait, uh, because Kuwait is the reason why the first US war against Iraq happened. Uh, Kuwait was actually, is actually older than Iraq, um, but they're both shockingly young. Kuwait was carved out of, the, out of the Ottoman Empire by the British in 1900, and uh, it had been part of a pattern of British, the British moving into the Persian Gulf. In the 19th century, they had made a deal with Oman, they then created the Trucial Coasts, they went into uh, Qatar, Bahrain, and then sort of the last step that they took was to go into Kuwait. And the reason that they really wanted Kuwait was because the British had realized something. They had just sort of done, they, they did something that Americans don't do, they read history and um, one of the problems Britain had was it had just lost its oil company. Its oil company was Shell. The Dutch had just bought it. And so as a result, the British owned 49% of Royal Dutch Shell, but the Dutch were clear to make sure that it was Royal Dutch Shell, not, not British Shell. And, and then, of course, Standard Oil was the other dominant oil company in the world at the time. And so the Brits were really keen that even though the United States and the Netherlands were allies, that they had their own oil company and they needed to find oil to make that work. And they realized by reading history, because the Arabs used to light their streets up at night with oil, that there was probably oil in the Middle East. So in 1900, they, they, they carved Kuwait out of the Ottoman Empire. And then uh, the next year or the year after, they make a deal with the Persians 
uh, that give them a 95% concession over any oil they find in Persia, which is outrageous. Usually it's a 50-50 deal. And they create the Anglo-Persian Oil Company. And sure enough, by the coincidence, ferry strikes again. Like a year or two later, they find oil in Persia, in Khuzestan, which is the south uh, west corner of Iran. And you know, the 95% concession deal goes into effect. The reason why this matters is because Kuwait was carved out of the Basra province of the Ottoman Empire. So then when World War I happens, the dying Ottoman Empire has its Arab, most of its Arab territory seized. Um, some of it was actually gifted back by the French. Um, but they, they end up losing most of the, the Ottoman Empire's Arabic-speaking area. And the, initially, the British under Sykes-Picot were going to give what is now Iraq to the French. Uh, the idea then was they would get southern Iran and then the Russians would get northern Iran, but the Russians have a communist revolution and mess the whole plan up and the British didn't think they could conquer Iran without Russian assistance. Um, so they decided that they were going to get what is now Iraq, which was three provinces. It was the Mosul province, the Baghdad province, and the Basra province. So when Iraq was created, it included the Basra province. The Basra province, the southern part of it went to what, is, what eventually became Saudi Arabia, but also a piece of it went to Kuwait. So <clears throat> just to add the weirdness to this, Iraq never existed. Iraq was a made-up thing that the British made up at the end of World War I. Um, it was part of their sort of divide and conquer strategy. Historically speaking, Ir Iraq was the part of Mesopotamia that usually was in the Persian Empire, and then uh, Syria was the part of Mesopotamia and the Levant that was traditionally in the Roman Empire. So there was sort of a semi-historical precedent for having Syria go, be a separate entity than Iraq, even though they, they would both occupy part of the, the part of Mesopotamia. But this, there was no, press, there was no necess, necessary reason for doing it at that moment. Um, so then fast forward. Iraq ends up as part of the British Empire. So the Arabs had a different in intention entirely. The Arab rebels who had been fighting with the British against the Ottoman Empire, uh, they intended to do was they intended to take what is now Saudi Arabia and all of the Ottoman Empire's Arabic-speaking territory and put it together and create a single kingdom and make Damascus its capital. And the British and the French systematically prevented that from happening. And so instead, you ended up with Syria and Jordan and Palestine and Iraq, um, and then a separate Saudi Arabia. The, the guy who was probably going to, was supposed to become the first king of that, Faisal, ends up becoming the king of Iraq because after the French defeat Faisal, uh, the British are like, hey, we heard you're really unemployed, you want to work for us in Iraq. And the Iraqis actually rebelled. And what ended up happening was the British launched an aerial bombardment campaign uh, using biplanes of Baghdad, which is really like the, the first airplane conducted aerial bombardment of a major city. Uh, during World War I, the, the, the Germans were using uh, blue dirigibles, blimps, to bomb London. But um, this was biplanes doing it. Iraq ends up more or less stable until 1958, when Iraq ends up having a revolution. They, they kill Faisal III. Uh, the socialists take over parliament, but then uh, a guy named Qasem ends up as president, and he ends up in this conflict with, with the socialists. Uh, Gossam gets assassinated by the CIA in 63. Iraq ends up in this period of just terrible uh, disarray, constant coup d'etats. It finally stabilizes in the 70s when the Ba'athists take over. Uh, Saddam Hussein is sort of an, uh, a number two kind of guy within the Ba'athist party, but before long, he actually ends up running the country, even though he's not president, and then eventually becomes president. Um, initially, we really liked... Saddam Hussein, we thought we could, we could make deals with him, that we could work with him. The CIA um, immediately put out you know, feelers to see where he was in, in, in his relationship with us. And by the 80s, of course, we're more or less in an informal alliance against Iran. Iraq goes to war with Iran, um, largely based on U.S. And intel. We, we sort of nudge Iraq. We, you can totally do this. And uh, it's a disaster. It's a catastrophe. The Iraqi military had, did, simply didn't have the ability to defeat the Iranian military. It was three times bigger. And even though it was in disarray because of a revolution, that revolutionary fervor actually helped the Iranians in battle. Um, I, I, I did a tour of Iran in 2002. 
and I was with an officer who had been in the Iranian military, and he actually took me through Khuzestan, and he showed me, like, ma this is the maximum penetration of Iraqi armor, this is maximum penetration of Iraqi infantry, and it just was not deep. I mean, it was a, it was, it was a disastrous thing for the Iraqis to do. And, of course, the war ends up like a World War I-style war with chemical weapons and trench warfare, and it's just a, a nightmare of an event. Um, at least a million people die. <clears throat> Uh, it last, the war lasts about eight years. At least a million people die. I've seen numbers higher, but I like to use lower numbers. Um, and in the aftermath of that, Iraq and, and Iran come out both quite poor. Uh, not potentially so, but they're both in debt because they've been buying weapons, um, including from the United States, right? Even though we had been very, very clear that nobody should be selling either Iraq or Iran weapons, we were totally selling both, actually, weapons. Um, we were selling the Iranians their uh, spare parts for four times the market price, so don't worry, we made a lot of money. Um, and then <clears throat> in the aftermath of that, OPEC makes this deal. And this is, this is kind of what sets us up and gets us in trouble. OPEC, both Iraq and Iran are OPEC members, and both Iraq and Iran go to OPEC and say, hey, look, we've had this catastrophic war where we were butchering each other for really, we can't, we don't know why at this point. Um, and we need a little bit of economic support. And so OPEC agreed they would cut production, all the OPEC members would cut production, allowing Iraq and Iran to increase production, but there wouldn't be a net change in the amount of oil in the marketplace, right? Because you don't, OPEC, people are a little confused about this. OPEC does not necessarily want the price of oil to go up. They, they, what they want is they want a stable amount of oil so that the price is just right to keep the economy going. Right? They're the drug dealer, we're the drug user. They don't want to mess us up. We'll stop buying their drug. We're addicted to this stuff. They want us to do really well. So you know, there's a little bit of guesswork in there, but that's, that's essentially their goal. So they didn't want to mess with the supply. What ends up happening is oil production shoots through the roof, the price bottoms out, and Iraq is baffled, Iran is baffled, OPEC's baffled because where's this extra glut of supply coming from, and of course it turns out it's Kuwait. And it, it, Kuwait maybe had a, a bit of rightful fear in flooding the markets, but their underlying goal, of course, was to destabilize Iraq and Iran and prevent them from recovering as quickly from the war. And ironically enough, what Kuwait was doing was they were drilling on oil fields that were on the border between Iraq and, and Kuwait that they had treaties about how fast you could drill and they were drilling faster than the treaties allowed, so they're effectively stealing Iraqi oil. Saddam Hussein calls the UN in to do inspections. The UN concludes that Iraq is not only stealing from oil fields that are both sides of the border, they were actually slant drilling under the border and into Iraqi oil fields, and just stealing from fields that were entirely in Iraq. Um, Saddam Hussein brings in Ambassador April Glasby to, uh, you know, figure out where things are going to go from here. Saddam Hussein had been warning Kuwait, we need to talk, we need to talk. Kuwait ignored all his warnings. Uh, you got to stop flooding the markets with our stolen oil. And um, it, Kuwait ignored it. So he brings her in and, it, and he says to her, Kuwait is stealing our oil. We have to do something about it. And her response is, what happens between Arab states is of no concern to the United States. Kuwait is Arab, Iraq is Arab. So he interpreted that, interpreted that as a green light, and he invades Kuwait. It's a 24-hour battle, uh, mostly because it took that long for the Kuwaiti military to run to Saudi Arabia as fast as it could go. And uh, Kuwait is annexed into Iraq, which Iraq sees as simply putting itself back together at that point. And interestingly enough, it meant an overall increase in civil rights to the people living in Kuwait because two-thirds of the population were foreigners and literally had no rights. And Saddam Hussein sets up a system where the Arabs instantly have, if they want it, uh, Iraqi citizenship, and then the non-Arabs can apply for it and can become naturalized if they want it. Um, <clears throat> initially, George Bush Sr. comes out and says, I don't see any problem with this. We're going to investigate it. We're going to look deeper. The next thing you know, Margaret Thatcher is flying to Aspen, Colorado. The two of them are meeting. Uh, George Bush Sr. comes out of the meeting saying he's a Hitler, we have to stop him, he's a Hitler. And the next thing you know, we have Desert Shield. And uh, before you know it, of course, we end up with Desert Storm. Um, <clears throat> Desert Shield is a remarkable, remarkable event because it has to be the, one of the largest 
buildups in military history where the other side literally did nothing about it. So effectively, Iraq allowed the United States to at will put whatever military assets it wanted to into Saudi Arabia and the, and the Arabian Gulf, or the Persian Gulf, also known as the Persian Gulf, um, without Iraq responding, right? So you think of World War I, one of the reasons why World War I happened is the, the Russian military mobilized and the Germans went, okay, <laughs> we're going to war, and the German military mobilized, right? And there was sort of like this domino effect. Here is the United States doing that, this long mobilization process, and Iraq lets it happen. And then, of course, Desert Storm happens, which is initially just a bombing campaign from hell. Um, there's about a month of just brutal, unremitting, unremitting bombing. We bombed everything. We bombed schools. We bombed bridges. We bombed hospitals. Uh, we bombed bomb shelters. Uh, it was a great way to test to see if we could actually penetrate deep and go through the concrete and kill everybody inside, and yet we could. Uh, we were quite successful. Um, and, you know, we, we killed a few tens of thousands of Iraqis. At one point, Saddam Hussein had actually put uh, some of the more unreliable units on the, the border between Iraq and Saudi Arabia, and then in trenches, and we just went in with bulldozers and just filled, filled them in and buried thousands of Iraqi soldiers alive. And the way we did it was we put the Egyptians in command of the Arab units, and, the, and then the United States, France, and Great Britain took the, the western flank. And so the Arab units would, would invade Kuwait and liberate it. And then the, uh, the, the white armies would swing. Isn't that interesting? Oh, it's just only white people doing this. They would swing out across and head toward Basra, um, which, depending on what, where we are in the news cycle, is either the second or third largest city in Iraq. Uh, it's, if, if Mosul is controlled by ISIL, it's suddenly the second largest city. But if there's something happening in Basra, it's the second largest city. And, and, it, and it, it's one of the two. I don't know anymore because the news media seems to keep changing what it is. Um, anyway, we swung out to Basra. We didn't capture it, but we basically cut the Iraqi military in half. And the Iraqi military, by the way, during the ground war, actually attempted to surrender multiple times. Um, the Russians actually interceded on the side of the Iraqis to surrender. Uh, George Bush Sr. refused the surrenders and insisted on conducting the, the ground war. Uh, the Iraqi soldiers then basically captured every vehicle they could, jumped on them, and got on the hot main highway to escape. And then we came in with incendiary weapons and set the highway on fire and burned them to death. Um, we then... Iraq re takes back its annexation of Kuwait. We then end up in this really weird situation where we decide that suddenly Iraq is this rogue state, um, even though we're the ones who gave them permission to invade Kuwait and then took it back. And then um, we end up in this period of time where this, it's this weird, like, in between the end of the war and August of 1990, where nobody really knows what's supposed to happen next. And George Bush Sr., makes a speech where he says, Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. They need, to, they need to be gotten rid of, and at which point we will let Iraq reintegrate into the world community. So the way we knew he had weapons of mass destruction, of course, is that we had actually kind of given them to or sold them to Iraq. And so we had, like, you know, the, we had the serial numbers on all the missiles. So we actually knew what he had, and he was using them against Iran. Um, just for the record, when the Halabja gassing took place, the Reagan administration had actually sent Gene Kirkpatrick to, Halabja, to, to Iraq to investigate to see who gassed Halabja, and the initial response was that Iran did it, even though, as far as I know, there's no evidence that Iran used gas during the war. Um, and so we were, we, we were so close to Saddam Hussein, we were actually willing to do a, a bold-faced lie cover-up to pretend it was Iran. It was U.S. intelligence that told Saddam Hussein that there were actually Iranian soldiers in the city, and then in... Uh, Iraq went in and gassed, I shouldn't say city, village. Uh, Iraq, Iraq went in and gassed the village during the night, and what had happened was the Iranians had pulled out and Kurds had moved in, and so it was sort of an accidental gassing. It's warfare. Um, in any case, these are the weapons of mass destruction. Uh, technically, I don't think ga chemical weapons are chemical weapons of mass destruction, but we'll just pretend and keep calling it that. Uh, I think they're more a terror weapon is what they are, but... Uh, nukes, biological weapons, are definitely weapons of mass destruction. In any case, uh, the UN weapons inspection program kicks in then in the next year, and UN weapons inspectors go, and they're on the ground, 
And they're basically telling the Iraqis, hand over your weapons. And the Iraqis go, we don't, we don't have any. And, you know, we pull out the receipts. <laughs> yeah, we supplied you with these. Can you turn them over? And uh, what ends up happening, Scott Ritter is, by the way, my source for this. He was the UN, the, the guy on the ground doing the weapons inspecting. Uh, he was a colonel in the United States Marine Corps and a self-identified Republican. And uh, he, he said that what happened was the Iraqis confessed that they had the weapons, but they had actually blown them up. And he said, well, I need the serial numbers, so you have to show me where you blew them up, and we're going to go find the serial numbers. And so a lot of what ended up happening then over the next seven years was Scott Ritter and the UN weapons inspection team just driving in the desert to these, these sites where they blew up their, their, their you know, uh, mustard gas and nerve agents and they're going out there and they're like sifting through the sand looking for the serial numbers. And by 1998, Scott, according to Scott Ritter, he had found probably 90, around 98% of the weapons. So in other words, they had accounted for most of them. Now most of them had a shelf life of about seven to nine years and the last deliveries were in the late 80s. So by 1998, they were also, you know, maybe they weren't inert, but they weren't, they weren't fresh anymore. It was like sour milk kind of weapon. So there really was no reason to continue the weapons inspection program, but Bill Clinton needed to distract the country. And so um, he, he, of course, liked to use countries. We would bomb them occasionally, like Sudan and Afghanistan and Iraq, to distract the country. And so he orders the weapons inspectors out of Iraq. And that ends the weapons inspection regime until we started up again in 2002. Um, it is worth pointing out that during that time period, the United States then imposed probably the nastiest sanctions in, in human history on the state of Iraq. We essentially cut off their food and medicine, and then we eventually made a deal called Food for Oil Program, where we started allowing some medicine and some food in in return for direct Iraqi oil sales. Um, the UN, so this isn't like some radical organization like Johns Hopkins or something, because uh, I'm going to quote them later. Uh, the UN uh, estimates that under the Bill Clinton administration, probably somewhere around 800,000 Iraqis died as a direct result of the sanctions. The, according to the UN numbers, 500,000 were age five and under. So uh, effectively, we murdered half a million babies um, by depriving Iraq of its food delivery and medicine. Médecins Sans Frontières uh, complained regularly that they just didn't have the medicine to take care of of, of, of the people in, in Iraq that they were volunteering to take care of. Um, so then comes George Bush Sr., I'm sorry, Jr., and <clears throat> we end up with 9-11, and somehow the Bush, the Bush administration begins this conflating event, right, where every time they say Osama bin Laden, they make sure to also say Saddam Hussein. So there's this these two guys' names are always coupled together, even though they were, they were such bad enemies that Osama bin Laden actually put a hit on Saddam Hussein. Um, and, you know, they're radically different. One's a secularist, one's, one's a fundamentalist. You know, uh, the vice president of Iraq at one point was Tarak Aziz. Tarak Aziz was a Christian. Saddam Hussein didn't care what your religion was. His goal was that you had to be loyal to him, whereas, you know, obviously for Osama bin Laden, your, your religion was the only thing that mattered. And so you have these two radically different people who could, under no circumstances, ever work together. And here's the Bush administration constantly saying, oh, these guys are working together. They staged 9-11. And it was insane and absurd. It made no sense. But... At that point, I think we were so overtaken by vengeance, the need for vengeance and emotion, <clears throat> that we were willing to believe anything, right? And so there was this, because they were so successful, so successful in conflating these two men and their identity in the media, we were willing to at least consider this war that the president was pushing for. By 2002, after Labor Day, because everybody knows that when you launch an ad campaign, you wait till after Labor Day, the Bush administration really began pushing for this, for a war. Um, the, they weren't really interested, apparently, in doing the weapons inspection program, but the UN insisted. They sent Hans Blix. They start the process up again. And, of course, there's, the, there's no weapons of mass destruction. We already know this. Scott Ritter has already really told us. Scott Ritter is on tour around the country going, there's no weapons. We don't have to, you don't have to do this. Um, but, you know, right? the American public is going along with this because there's, there's a part of us that just really wants, to be frank, Arabs to die, right? They did 9-11, now we gotta get them back. Um, so finally, the Bush administration says they can do it without UN 
consent. In fact, at one point, the Bush administration insisted that they could do the war in Iraq without Congress uh, consenting. But of course, finally, they, they accept no Congress needs to. Congress passes the legislation allowing this to happen. And we uh, finally go in. Uh, today is the 15th anniversary. So it's not the 15th anniversary of mission accomplishment. It's the 15th anniversary of us going into Iraq. Uh, the date is a really interesting date because, of course, it's also it was the first day of spring, so that's kind of a weird thing to do. You're going to launch, you know, spring, life, and love, and bombs. Um, and, then, and then it was also Iranian New Year, which really felt like a signal to Iran, because Iranians take Iranian New Year very seriously. This is like their Christmas. And so for us to do this on this day almost felt like we were giving everybody uh, a big, big middle finger um, and I, Ramadan was happening, I think. I, I actually don't remember where, where they were in Ramadan. Maybe it was later on that Ramadan was happening. Anyway, so it was, it was this really strange date that we picked. But here's the, the weird thing. Well, it's not that weird. It's very consistent. Um, we called the initial operation shock and awe. What's the definition of terror? The state of being sh in shock and awe. So here we are, we're doing this war on terrorism, and we're naming the initial operation we have in Iraq, terror. It's as if we, we're admitting to the world, our goal is we're going we're gonna to terrorize the Iraqis into submission. And, and strangely enough, the shock and awe campaign ended up being a lot less shocking, and I think a lot less awful than everybody had anticipated. The, the bombing that was done under uh, Senior in 1991, in spring of 1991, that bombing campaign, I think I earlier said 90, uh, it was 91. Uh, August of 91 is when the, 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 they blew up the weapons. Um, when the bombing campaign took place in 1991, that, the, the, the amount of tonnage used was really amazing. Like it was, it, we, people were comparing it to episodes of World War II, um, whereas the, the 2003 event wasn't so clear. Here's the thing, the argument was that we're going to go to war with Iraq because they, they, they have weapons of mass destruction and they're considering developing the nuke, they might at some point in the future use those weapons against us, right? Because Iraq never attacked the United States. The Iraq never threatened to attack the United States. There's no evidence that Iraq actually supported any terrorist organization that attacked the United States. In fact, the, the twisted irony of it all is just a few years earlier, Iraq was our ally. So we turned on an ally and attacked our ally after giving them permission to to invade Kuwait. And so there's this big question mark of why the hell are we doing this? And I remember, I want to do this because I want to bring this to us. Like, I want to put this on us. Because I think Americans feel like politics is something that just happens. You vote every two to four years, depending on if you're in the 35% or the 55%. And, you know, you can just, it's on autopilot, and everything is going to be just fine. You don't have to actually be engaged or participate. But I, rem I remember confronting people about this after the war had started, liberals about this after the war had started. And they, they said, now the president has said we need to do this, or actually even before the war had started, the president said we need to do this, we have to do it, we have to support him. And, I, and I'm like, but why? There's no basis for a war against Iraq, right? Belgium, France, and Germany are saying, you're doing to Iraq what Germany did in 1939 to Poland. There's, you know it's a problem when Germany's like, hey, hey, please don't do this. We did this before. It ruined the world order by starting World War II. Surely this isn't a good thing to do. And, and they would say, we need to follow the president's wishes and desires. Um, after it became clear that there were no weapons in, in, of mass destruction in Iraq, right? Because conquer the place uh, pretty fast. It didn't take long. Um, it took shockingly long, considering how, how, how terrible the Iraq, what shape the Iraqi military was in. Like, if you compare it to what the Germans did to Poland in World War II, we look like a bunch of amateurs who can't do warfare. But if you, you know, cons considering that Iraq was a, this relatively large state, it, it did fall pretty fast. And then we ended up not finding any weapons of mass destruction. Um, compared to what the Germans did to France in World War II, we look like a bunch of amateurs. Um, I, we immediately switched our position. Suddenly now we're start, we started talking about, oh, well, we're going to liberate women. Oh, well, we're going we're gonna to create democracy. Oh, we're going to reconfigure the Middle East in a new way that's going to stimulate these democratic movements. There, there was a map floating around because there was this group called the Project for the New American Century 
that a lot of the Bush administration was actually a part of. And this map that was floating around was uh, somebody had taken a crayon, just like they did with Sykes-Picot with, to the Middle East, and just started drawing. <laughs> and they, they chopped up Iraq into three separate states. And, you know, and, and there was this letter that the Project for a New American Century had put out where they said that after Iraq, they should invade either Syria or Iran, and then do the other one, and then do Saudi Arabia, and then invade Egypt. And, and so you know, there were all these grandiose empire building. We, I think there was some of us who thought we were the British Empire reborn and we were reshaping the world in our own image. There was also a religious component to this. Oh, we're going to Christianize Iraq. The Bush administration is going to send uh, missionaries to Iraq, and we're going to transform Iraq religiously as well. Just for the record, um, about three quarters of the Iraqi Christian population has fled the country. So we've actually had the exact opposite effect. We've actually homogenized Iraq more than it was already. I mean, it was never a homogenous place, but we've, we've at least de-Christianized Iraq very successfully. Um, the irony is, is a lot of the refugees that ended up in Syria, and then ultimately in Turkey, and then eventually trying to get into the European Union, were actually Christian Arabs trying to get out of, the, out of our bombing campaign way, and our, our war way. The occupation period, that initial, after we invade and conquer, that initial period is actually relatively calm. Um, 2003, there's like these little things happening, but it, it's, it's not coherent, it's very chaotic, it's, spar it's sporadic. Um, I think the Iraqi people weren't sure. Maybe this is going to turn out okay. Um, we appointed Paul Bremer to be the new president of Iraq. He only did it for one year, but it's really weird. Uh, last time I checked, Bremer was a German name, not a, an Arab name. And, and then in 2004, what ended up happening was we did something really strange. Uh, we didn't even do this after World War II with Germany. I mean, we did it partially. We did denazification in World War II, so we called it debathification in Iraq. But what we did was we got rid of the Iraqi state. And I don't just mean like we got rid of the top leadership in the Iraqi state. We got rid of the police. We got rid of the military. We got rid of the bureaucracy. We annihilated the Iraqi state. And we were going to build Iraq from the ground up. And what ended up happening was a bunch of unemployed Iraqis who had been running the Iraqi state decided they were going to get rid of this occupation force. In 2004, they formed Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and they began a, camp, a military campaign against us that by 2005, very rapidly, we felt like we were losing this war. Um, we were in crisis mode. So in 2006... Um, Petraeus, General Petraeus, comes up with the, the Sunni Awakening Program. What that was was uh, we shipped crates of $20 bills, and we had forklifts that we shipped into Iraq, and we just literally forklifted the crates around and delivered millions of dollars in cash to Iraqi warlords, uh, Sunni warlords, and so we awoken them, because right, cash smells good, like it's like coffee, and it's just like this stimulant, and it just wakes you up. And what we did was we basically bribed those Iraqi warlords into switching sides, into st not, no longer fighting alongside al-Qaeda against us. The, in 2006, the Iraqi warlords realized that the time that we were going to be in Iraq was, was limited. And so they, they realized it was not only advantageous to get the money, because then they could use it uh, against each other, Right, to figure out who is going to end up on char in charge on the other side, or at least to expand their, their influence and territory uh, by buying weapons. But the Iraqis could, could, could also wipe out al-Qaeda in Iraq, which nobody wanted to have in, in Iraq anyway. They were just, it was an alliance of convenience to fight the United States. And so they did. They turned on them, and al-Qaeda in Iraq gets so badly beaten that by 2008 it flees Iraq, and it actually went into Syria. And the, the twist was that Bashar al-Assad, the president of Syria, probably could have wiped them out, but he decided to let them operate out of Syria with the hope that at some point in the future they would recover and then they would be a thorn in our side in Iraq, right? Because he, he had no love for them. They, they, they were his enemy as well. It's just enemy of an enemy is a friend, which is, by the way, a terrible saying. It all, always ends badly. Stop thinking this. Uh, be picky about your friends. Just really, you know what I mean? Like, so much can be told about who you are by your friends. Um, what ends up happening is we, we declare this a big victory. The, the Bush administration actually goes 
to the Iraqis and sets up a timetable for withdrawal. So one of the things you'll hear sometimes is Obama shouldn't have withdrawn. That was actually a deal that the Bush administration made. And then um, Obama comes into office and he actually postpones the withdrawal by several months, but he does eventually affect the withdrawal um, by 20, 2011. One of the things that we had tried to do or we were thinking about under the Bush administration was that there would be a permanent US presence in Iraq, but they, they gave up on that by 2008. Like the idea of that became horrific. Um, we're just gonna do that with Afghanistan. And by permanent, I mean like until the US empire is destroyed. Um, in any case, 2011 is also a shocking year because it's the year the Arab Spring happens. And the Arab Spring tries to take off in Syria and Bashar al-Assad decides he's not gonna have anything to do with that and he starts just pretty nasty, pretty brutal oppression. Uh, he, there are some children who are spraying graffiti and he has the mass arrested. And the next thing you know, there's a civil war, which of course in retrospect now was a complete mistake. The Syrians should have just not done this. Um, but Al-Qaeda in Iraq realizes they've got their opportunity. They rename themselves Islamic State in Iraq and the Levant, ISIL, not ISIS. And in Arabic, it's Dalat al-Islamiyah fi Iraq wal Shab, so Daesh, right? But in, there's no way to get ISIS out of this other than, I don't know, you just... You could do Sham in okay, but then Turkish, <laughs> ISIS. Although it would be ISIS. <laughs> it would be ISIS. ISIS. Yeah, there's no... Obama said ISIS. He did, and, and it is ISIL. Uh, when, by the way, they were kicked out of Al-Qaeda because they were considered too brutal at this point. Uh, you know you're in trouble when Al-Qaeda is like, oh, God, you guys look like a bunch of war criminals. Too far. Too far. <laughs> Too far. <laughs> and there was also a serious disagreement about whether or not to create an, an Islamic state. And Al-Qaeda thought it was too soon. ISIL thought, let's do it now. Um, with three years later, ISIL then invades Iraq uh, with 900 men and cars. They're, they're driving in cars and pickup trucks and they encounter 60,000 US trained, US equipped Iraqi soldiers. Those Iraqi soldiers melt like, like butter. They just, they just vanish in front of 900 guys driving pickup trucks and cars and they drop, they're dropping their uniforms, they're dropping their assault rifles, they're, they're, they're abandoning their tanks, they abandon helicopters. Everything, instantaneously, ISIL is suddenly armed with the best U.S. equipment. And they end up with possession of about 30% of Syria and almost 50% of the land area of Iraq, including its, at that moment at least, second largest city of Mosul. Um, and, it, and, and in 2004, there's this moment of, what just happened? And of course, what happened was something absolutely catastrophic. Iraq, so historically speaking, the world has always had a Middle East superpower. There, there has never been a period of time in world history that lasted a long period anyway, where there wasn't a Middle East superpower. So when, when Timur Lang, or sorry, when the Mongols under Hulugu Khan wipe out the Seljuks, there's this brief period of time when there is no Middle East superpower. And then the Ottoman Empire rises up from the ashes after Timur Lang goes through another round of slaughter. And then Ottoman Empire becomes such an epic superpower in the world that it actually besieges Vienna twice, right? Polish cavalry save it the second time, just for the record. That's how desperate the, the Austrians were. So post-World War I, there's this really weird, unnatural, never occurred before moment where there is no superpower in the Middle East. The superpowers are all in Europe and as, as we continue to progress towards this date here, other superpowers start to appear, like Japan and China and now India. But there's still this vacuum, this power vacuum in the Middle East where there is no natural superpower. If you're gonna have a superpower in the Middle East, historically they pop up in places like Iraq, Iran, and Egypt and Turkey. Those are the natural locations for a superpower. By the time we do the Iraq war, the first one and the second, well, the first one mo mostly, the second one, Iraq was a basket case because we had starved it to death. By the time we do that Iraq war, the superpowers in the Middle East were Egypt, Turkey, Iran, Iraq, and then to a lesser degree, Syria and Israel and Saudi Arabia was sort of coming into itself. But the, the real superpowers were Iraq, Egypt, Turkey, and, and Iran. We took Egypt out of the equation by bribing them. We just pay them billions of dollars and they, they they go into a coma and they're gone. 
Iran, of course, was our vicious enemy because they rejected us. Again, they never attacked us. They just rejected us. And our pride, we can't take it. We're like a jilted lover. And then we destroyed Iraq. And in the process of destroying Iraq, we created this catastrophic power vacuum. And then, and then that, that destruction fell over into Syria. And, and now Syria is in ruins, although it's, it's slowly coming back. And so what we've done is we've completely destabilized the Middle East. Interestingly enough, that de destabilization has reached all the way to Nigeria. It's reached all the way to Pakistan. It's reached all the way to Sweden. We've destabilized everything from Nigeria to Sweden, from Morocco to Pakistan. But our enemies, obviously, right, like France and Germany, countries that we really hate, and we've caused millions of people to flood into those countries, like Turkey, and destabilized it even more, and probably helped push Turkey more towards an authoritarian state, although you can't completely blame that on us. Um, and so the, the situation that we're in now is entirely of our own making from a war that we never had to fight because there was no reason to do so to begin with that has had these really incredible ramifications, including the creation of ISIL and now creating the situation where some, somehow, I still can't wrap my mind around this, Saudi Arabia has become the war regional superpower. Like, it's Saudi Arabia versus I Iran, and now Turkey's invaded Syria. It's like Turkey is like, no, we're still here. And, you know, now Israel is, like, systematically bombing Syria. We're here still. But, but it's, it's become this massive tug-of-war between the Saudis who have come out of nowhere and exerting themselves and, and Iran. Um, and then on that note, I'm going to stop because I want you to jump in. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, okay. There we go. Um, all right, yeah, thanks. So I'm going to uh, build on what uh, Roy said in uh, a kind of thematic way to draw out some broader questions for the discussion that we'll have in the next part of this event, and then also add on some, uh, just some uh, details and anecdotes related to several of the points that he he brought up. I mean, I think one of the, the main things to take away from what uh, has already been covered is that, uh, you know, there are lots of kinds of wars in history. And the Iraq War of 2003 was a war of choice. We, when we face the question, you know, why do countries go to war, uh, you know, one historic answer has been they're threatened. They go to war because they want to continue existing. They don't want to be subjugated by some foreign power. That answer is not a good explanation for why the United States goes to war. The United States and Americans are basically one of the safest populations, one of the most secure populations in the world. The US, unlike a European country, has no a history or concern about its neighbors invading it. There's no concern about Mexico or Canada you know, rolling tanks over the border or starting to strafe our major cities or bomb them with biplanes or whatever <laughs> or launch intercontinental ballistic missiles. Uh, and in fact, historically in the Western Hemisphere, as those of you who have studied Latin American history know, it's, it's actually traditionally been the opposite. The, the US has aggressed against its neighbors rather than being aggressed upon. So, I mean, really, to think about the US fighting a war not of its choice, you have to get into the realm of like Hollywood dramas like Red Dawn, um, a movie that I grew up with where the Soviets and the Cubans invade and take over um, half of the United States. And they're fought. Patrick Swayze leads a ragtag um, high school uh, team to push them back, and it's totally modeled, actually, after the Afghan Mujahideen were fighting against the Soviet Union and were idolized during the 1980s as freedom fighters. Uh, so that's just a starting point to keep in mind. Um, even though Americans may, may feel unsafe, of course, we just had something in Austin the past couple weeks that made people feel unsafe. You know, statistically, Americans are super safe. Um, and in fact, the things that make them unsafe are things they don't pay any attention to, like Distracted driving, which kills pe more people every 48 hours than ISIS killed in San Bernardino, or the ISIS, you know, whatever, inspirees killed in San Bernardino in 2015. Uh, 17 people every 48 hours die of, uh, uh, in accidents related to distracted driving. And we could go through the statistics. You're more likely to uh, slip and fall and um, 
uh, perish in a bathtub than, uh, than from a terrorist attack. So, and I say this having lived in places like Egypt where, in 2015, where, um, yeah, there was a bombing like somewhere in the city every week. And it was, I mean, this past week in Austin's kind of been like deja vu of that. There was a bombing every week, but still people went about their business. And it was a lot more serious than, than this guy um, in Austin. Uh, so Americans are actually very safe. Now, they may feel unsafe, they may feel traumatized, but when you look at the evidence, they are safe. And that continued to be the case after September 11th. Even Michael Bloomberg, a Republican at, um, when he was mayor of New York, reminded Americans, and he's living in Manhattan, which would be kind of you know, the target for any major Al-Qaeda attack or you know, in their top five list. He, he tells people, you're more likely to be struck by lightning than be hit by a terrorist attack. So. So, okay, very safe country, um, but historically, uh, at least the last 120 years, very aggressive country. So that's kind of a, a, a puzzle or something that we wouldn't automatically think would go together. If we saw another country that was so safe and yet so aggressive, we might really wonder, like, why is this, why is this happening? And... I, you know, part of it can be that the public gets panicked upon occasions, on occasions like after Pearl Harbor, after 9-11. But generally what we find is that these wars are driven not so much by initial public concerns or a, a sort of groundswell calling for wars. We don't see social movements filling the streets chanting, you know, we shall overthrow that dictator. We shall go occupy that country. No, these wars tend to start from the top of government among um, a pretty small set of elites. And by elites, I simply mean influential policymakers, people who have regular and substantial influence over national policy. And their viewpoints, and we have the data that show this in surveys of elites as well as surveys of the general public, their viewpoints tend to be more uh, bellicose than the average Americans, more um, aggressive, more inclined to pursue military options over diplomacy. And so there is a well-established disconnect between the way that foreign policy elites look at the world and the way ordinary Americans look at the world. For example, with Iraq in 2003, by the time of the March invasion in 2003, a majority of Americans supported the war. If you ask them a generic question like, do you think the United States should go into Iraq and remove Saddam Hussein from power? For a generic question like that, it was about two-thirds of Americans who were polled who would say, yes, I approve. Yes, we should do that. If you started giving them details, however, like what if the UN Security Council doesn't approve it and they hadn't approved it? What if there are thousands of casualties? What if the war lasts for several years? That majority quickly decreases. It shrinks and pretty soon you're at less than 50%. By contrast, if you polled not just the foreign policy makers, but also the circle around him of foreign policy commentators, including op-ed columnists for major newspapers, people who appear on television, that kind of thing. There was near unanimity about support for the war, uh, support for the Iraq war. And this is not just on the right, but it's also very much on the left, as Roy has mentioned. So you have people like Glenn Greenwald, who supported the Iraq War, who's one of the most, uh, would, who would go on to become one of the most outspoken uh, critics of both uh, Bush and Obama, and he's currently a critic of the Trump administration too. Um, Al Franken, who was not yet in the Senate yet, uh, but would become a luminary of the Democratic Party for a while. So it was like near 100% in terms of elites, and it was about 66% in terms of the general public. So I just want to keep that in mind because when we read the op-ed 
op-ed page in the Austin American Statesman or the New York Times, or we turn on shows, even shows that on the spectrum of mainstream news coverage may feel liberal or kind of more pluralist and more diverse, more inclusive in their viewpoints, it shows like the PBS NewsHour, um, yeah, you listen to NPR, you're, you're getting, you tend to get a more interventionist uh, set of opinions than you would get if you just pulled the average person on the street. So these wars are, that just adds to the puzzle. These wars are not exactly uh, democratic representations of the public will. And in fact, their impacts often run counter to the public interest. One of the ways why we can, one of the ways to explain this kind of puzzle of wars of choice that end up being quite costly is to look at who benefits from the wars. There's a well-known phenomenon in politics and economics that you might have something that you get into, let's say the Vietnam War, that ends up costing the country as a whole uh, a great deal. So 58,000 Americans died in Vietnam, many more were injured. We still have veterans of the Vietnam War today who are being treated for PTSD uh, in uh, mental health centers all across the country, including in California, and I'm sure there's some being treated in Texas as well. And, and so those, I mean, those costs extend long after the war has ended. So tremendous costs in Vietnam. Well, okay, but those, that, that cost is spread out over time, and it's spread out over the population. Meanwhile, you may have concentrated benefits. You may have people who want to get elected, re-elected into office, and they think being tough on communism in Vietnam is gonna help them do that. You may have people who are working for uh, weapons manufacturers or chemical companies, and it's like, okay, if we make more napalm, that's gonna help our bottom line, that's gonna help our quarterly earnings. So you can have these phenomenon of concentrated benefits and diffuse costs that can help to explain why you would get into wars of choice that do not have public support overall, that are not serving a greater public interest, and that end up uh, inflicting tremendous cost. Now the cost for the Iraq war, and I'll add here the Afghanistan war, in terms of US lives lost, is not at the level of Vietnam. It's, it's an order of magnitude less than that. It's, right now it's around 7,000 Americans uh, who lost their lives in Iraq, the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. Um, over a million wounded in some, one way or the other, physically, uh, psychologically. And the, the, um, the VA had stopped reporting the, the exact numbers on that once the number crossed um, a million. Um, so significant costs in America, and then the costs in Iraq are much higher. We're talking about hundreds of thousands killed violently, um, whether from Iraqis in the Civil War or, or from US forces, as well as the kind of knock-on effects of that in terms of public health and other damage that could be caused, the kinds of things that Iraqis uh, suffered under the sanctions in the 1990s. Uh, so, yeah, a lot of costs there. Uh, oh, and then uh, just in, in terms of money, the Iraq war, Iraq and Afghanistan wars are costing the United States trillions of dollars, um, both in terms of what's already been spent and then long-term financing of the debt and veterans care, uh, medical treatments, which, you know, if we're currently treating Vietnam vets in California, we can expect to be treating you know, Iraq war, and I hope we will be uh, taking care of them, Iraq war and, Viet and Afghanistan veterans for, uh, well, the rest of my life, and since many of them are, are your age, probably the rest of your lives as well. So tremendous costs, but then we do, but perhaps concentrated benefits for, for some um, in, who actually have control over foreign policy making. I want to mention the one, one big uh, caveat or caution before uh, proceeding with any type of uh, analysis of, kind of who is behind a certain war or who gets us into wars. Often people look at who benefited at the end of a war, sort of like who ended up benefiting, and they think, well, that person or th that group 
must have been the one promoting the war. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail today in the time available to um, develop a specific argument about who the, um, the beneficiaries were, but it's important to recognize that that kind of reasoning is not um, is faulty. It's not valid. It, um, you don't want to go to the end, to the outcome, and see who benefited. You want to see who is participating in the policy making process at the beginning, and who expects to benefit. I mean, you could see how ridiculous this would be to look at the outcomes and judge who is bef who is in favor of war or who is against it. It would be like saying, well, since Hitler ended up having to kill himself and losing so badly, he must have been against World War II. <laughs> And since FDR or Truman, you know, since the U.S. prevailed and they came up dominating the war, dominating the world after World War II, then the U.S. must have really pushed for World War II, right? So don't go with the ultimate beneficiaries. And this regularly happens in uh, literatures that are critical of foreign policy making, U.S. foreign policy making, and critical of the Iraq War, the Afghanistan War, and other wars of choice. That you know, because oil prices went up after the Iraq War, um, quite high in 2004 through uh, 2008, that and the oil companies, all oil companies, anyone who was dealing in oil as a commodity, whether it was Exxon Mobil or non-U.S. oil companies like uh, France's company Total, Russian oil company Luke Oil, all of these companies made money. Um, it doesn't mean that because they got incredible profits in 2006 that they were pushing for the war in 2002 or 2003. And in fact, France and Russia and their oil companies were uh, opposed to the war because it was going to mess up the deals that they were already working on with Saddam Hussein. So that's, that's a broader question, one that I think about a lot, and I'm... I'm writing a book on it, and I don't have kind of quick answers, but um, why does the U.S. keep getting into these wars, and why does it continue? There's, I mean, we now have, from Bush, Obama, and Trump, three, uh, three men who won the Electoral College, who campaigned as... Uh, less interventionist than the candidate they defeated. So Bush in 2000, in the 2000 campaign, criticized Al Gore and Clinton for engaging in nation building. He said he wasn't into nation building, the US military should just be used to fight and win wars. Obama criticized, he criticized the Iraq war before it was launched as a dumb war. Uh, he, was very, he was critical of it as a senator. And then he, uh, it took him years to get out of Iraq, and he actually increased the U.S. presence in Afghanistan. And in fact, most uh, Americans who died in Afghanistan died during Obama's presidency, not during Bush's presidency. And then you have Trump, who was slamming the wars of both um, Bush and Obama, and is currently increasing the number of troops in Afghanistan, um, and being very bellicose in other areas as well. So there's a, there's a significant continuity here. There are differences between the administrations, but there's a significant and remarkable amount of continuity. And this fits with a, a broader pattern, a historical pattern, that really goes back to 1898. I'm not going to get in through the whole thing, but what I want to point out, so in 1898, the U.S. went to war with Spain, um, in particular over... Spanish control in Cuba and the Philippines. And the US militarily quickly defeated the Spanish. And actually, the defeat of the Spanish Armada in the Philippines, which was a colony of Spain, uh, the defeat happened on May 1st of 1898. So exactly 105 years before the Mission Accomplished Banner for the, uh, the Iraq War. And that really began, that moment began kind of the U US imperialism which would stretch into the early 20th century. Imperialism of the Philippines, Cuba, but also substantial parts of Central America, Haiti, Nicaragua, um, as well, and Dominican Republic, too. Uh, 
And I mention this because that is kind of, that's like really ancient history. When people talk about nation building and they talk about military intervention, especially if they're proponents of wars of choice, they cite Germany and Japan as the examples. And Condoleezza Rice and Bush and others who spoke publicly about Iraq said that Iraq could turn out like Germany and Japan. Because after all, look what happened in Germany and Japan. We had these uh, fascistic regimes that were so authoritarian. They were adversaries not only of the US but of Western Europe. And then just a few years later, after they were defeated, they were healthy democracies and strong partners of the United States. So if Germany and Japan could do it, why can't Iraq do it? Well, instead of citing Germany and Japan, they, it would have been more instructive for them to cite the Philippines, Cuba, Nicaragua, these other early 20th century cases, places where U.S. occupation was followed by civil war or a new dictatorship. It was not followed by um, a democracy or some type of strong constitutional government. And the success of Germany and Japan owed more to what the Germans and the Japanese themselves could do than what the U.S. brought from abroad. Germany and Japan, although they did have fascist governments, they also had a history of constitutional governments with, with substantial elements of representative democracy. And they were able to revive those elements and build on them. They weren't starting from scratch. They weren't resolving basic questions of kind of who belongs in the nation and who doesn't. They weren't operating inside of kind of externally imposed boundaries like what Iraqis were dealing with. So there was just no, no historical evidence that Iraq, when it came down to kind of tallying the success cases of American-led nation building and the failure cases, there was no historical evidence to suggest that Iraq was going to be in the success column. And so we have that, we have that history, and when people say, like oh, as Roy referenced, you know, Obama shouldn't have withdrawn, he shouldn't have gotten out of Iraq, Kind of like they're saying now, the U.S. shouldn't withdraw, shouldn't get out of Afghanistan. The, the problem, the sort of decisive moment is whether or not you intervene, whether or not you launch the war in the first place and you topple the dictatorship. At that point, the best thing to do is, is, is withdraw and intervene as little as possible. At least maybe support the country, but allow it to determine its own destiny. Further foreign occupation is not going to help the country. The U.S. sticking in Iraq after uh, 2011 would not have um, brought about any uh, better outcome than where we are today, just as the U.S. sticking around in Afghanistan is not substantially helping the, um, the outcome in Afghanistan. Uh, I think I just want to close by going a little bit more into... The, um, the process of how the U.S. got into the Iraq War in 2003 and some of the, the, the arguments that were used and the lack of evidence behind them. And I think that'll, that'll kind of set us up for, for discussion. One thing to point out here is that although people are very familiar with the deception that got the U.S. In, that was part of the public relations campaign preceding the 2003 Iraq War, I think there's a lot less familiarity with the deception that was involved in the Gulf War I, the 1991 Gulf War operations, Desert Shield and Desert Storm, the kinds of details that Roy laid out about how there was a basic economic grievance and political grievance that Saddam Hussein had with Kuwait. He was not just sort of willy-nilly, recklessly going into Kuwait um, without sort of basically checking with his boss in Washington. Uh, you know, dictators are a lot of things. They're, they tend not to be risk takers. They don't really want to sort of stick their necks out and get into a fight with someone who's a lot stronger uh, militarily than they are. And the evidence is that Saddam Hussein would not have gone into Kuwait if he had had some stronger signal from the United States that 
the, Bush the first Bush administration was going to respond the way it did. In addition to that, another kind of layer of the, the Gulf War I narrative is that Saddam Hussein was not only going to take Kuwait, he was then going to invade Saudi Arabia. And this claim it continues to be repeated by some very intelligent political scientists that I've recently been reading in current books. This is still going uh, circulating in the literature. There's no evidence that Saddam Hussein was going to go into Saudi Arabia or try to uh, take, invade Saudi Arabia. Um, there is evidence that the Bush administration completely exaggerated that threat as a way of justifying its military buildup. And further, the, the first Bush administration did not pursue meaningful diplomatic options when they were available for basically arranging Saddam Hussein to, um, to walk back his annexation of Kuwait and de-escalate the situation without military conflict. Um, and the evidence of that is that if the US had simply wanted to deter uh, a Iraqi invasion of Saudi Arabia, the US could have mobilized a, a much smaller force um, in order to repel any possible Iraqi incursion. Instead, it, it mobilized a massive force involving uh, roughly a half a million troops, calling up the National Reserves and the, uh, or the Reserves and the National Guard uh, right after the midterm elections in 1990. And this was not the kind of, uh, this was not a defensive force. This was a, an offensive force. Um, so I just point that out because this, this whole um, Saddam Hussein was going to take uh, Saudi Arabia claim is kind of like the WMD claim of um, the, the sort of WMD analog for 1990-91, but unlike the WMD claims of the 2003 war, it continues to, to circulate and it hasn't really been uh, thoroughly, um, it, it kind of remains in the, the faulty common sense that people have when they talk about Iraq. Okay, so on to the, the 2003 war. I would just, um, yeah, here add a, a, a little more information about kind of the, the run-up to the war and the links, uh, the connections and intersections with 9-11. One of the things that's interesting about George, the George W. Bush administration and its um, war with Iraq is that uh, according to Paul O'Neill, who was Secretary of uh, the Treasury under Bush for about a year, Bush put Iraq on his national security agenda from his very first month in office. So he was talking about Iraq, talking about options for some type of ground invasion that neither his father nor Bill Clinton had contemplated, and he was talking about it months before 9-11. Um, so there was some ambition here or interest in going after Saddam Hussein. And the reason was that Iraq, U.S. policy toward Iraq was at an impasse. The U.S. had imposed sanctions on Iraq for years, and that was part of a multilateral effort. It was authorized by the U.N. Security Council. Other countries were participating. But those sanctions were, were crumbling, and it didn't look like they could be maintained much longer. So what's going to happen to Iraq? If the sanctions just eventually crumble and are lifted, and you still have Saddam Hussein in power, then you go back to Saddam Hussein being a heavyweight in, in the Gulf, to him being able to sell his oil freely, um, potentially rebuild his military capacity. And it's not that he's going to like try to retake Kuwait or something, um, but you would have this, uh, this figure that George W. Bush didn't care for and that many in Washington were just sort of like dead set against. I mean, it, it, it irked them, it irked the people around Bush that Saddam Hussein got to stay in power after the 1991 war. They were complaining all through the 1990s that this was unsatisfying, that when a, a dictator stands up to the U.S. and he gets compared to Hitler, he doesn't get to last after he's, after, if the U.S. wins the war, the dictator should be gone. So. So that was one, but that's one possibility, okay? Sanctions are not going to last forever, and then you've got Saddam Hussein still in power. Or the other thing is you just remove him, and then you don't have the sanctions anymore, and you just let Iraqis run Iraq. So there's evidence that Bush was going ahead and pursuing that second option even before 9-11. 9-11, uh, 
overall may have been, may, may have facilitated the invasion. But at the time, it forced it onto the back burner because the, the whole kind of political momentum of the country was you've got to go after the people who did 9-11, so you've got to go after Osama bin Laden and his hosts, the Taliban in Afghanistan. And so Afghan the Afghanistan war comes first. But then 2002 rolls around, and Bush's team is back working on invading Iraq. And this builds up in the early months of 2002 in private. We know this from many different insider accounts of the Bush administration. And by the summer, Bush, with Tony Blair, uh, Prime Minister of Great Britain, um, as his partner, have decided, like, yeah, we're going we're gonna to invade uh, Saddam Hussein. And that, uh, we're going to invade Iraq and topple Saddam Hussein. And at that point, it's just a matter of how and what sort of public arguments they're going to make. And the public argument that they make is one based on uh, so-called weapons of mass destruction. We say so-called because, as Roy already pointed out, a lot of times these weapons are not destroying more lives or physical like, property than bombs, regular, you know, like bombs, which we don't call WMDs. So the term WMD is kind of like the term terrorism. You need to put it in quotes. You need to sort of keep, uh, keep it at arm's length and think about it critically. Um, because in many cases, these are not these are not weapons that are going to devastate a city like what the U.S. did to Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So, but, okay, so WMDs, biological, chemical, and nuclear weapons, um, links to Al-Qaeda, and then that combination, that somehow Saddam Hussein could provide a, a nuclear bomb or some type of bio, biological uh, weapon to members of Al-Qaeda and then they could smuggle it into the United States and attack, and it would be something worse than September 11th. Well, as Roy has already pointed out, Saddam Hussein was not in cahoots with Al-Qaeda, different ideologies, they were, they were enemies. Um, so, which by our logic means one of them should be our friend, right? Because enemy of my enemy. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, these claims were, were not based on the evidence. Uh, Scott Ritter disproved them. And then when they did have people who were making the claims, those sources were immediately suspect. So, for example, with respect to the notion that Saddam Hussein had biological weapons laboratories, the source for this claim was an Iraqi defector in Germany um, who hated Saddam Hussein. And the members of the intelligence community, so the, the spies in Germany, uh, they, they had a nickname for this guy, Curveball. They called him Curveball because he was known for making stuff up, creating, fabricating uh, crazy stories. So this guy, Curveball, um, tells uh, some of his contacts in the intelligence community that Saddam Hussein has these biological weapons laboratories. And later on, um, Curveball totally confesses that he made the whole thing up. This is not the kind of guy that intelligence professionals in the U.S. wanted to take at face value. But curveball statements sort of went into the pipeline, and they went into the Bush administration's case, uh, including Colin Powell's presentation in, Mar in February of 2003 before the U.N. Security Council, um, trying to convince the Security Council that Saddam Hussein was a, a grave threat to the international community. Uh, the other, another major source, uh, the source on Saddam Hussein's ties to Al Qaeda, was a guy named Ibn Sheikh Elibi. So this guy Ibn Sheikh Elibi had been hanging out with Al Qaeda in Afghanistan, and when the Afghanistan war happened, he fled, tried to get out of the country like m many of his compatriots, and he was picked up in Pakistan. And he was handed over from Pakistani intelligence to the FBI that began. Um, interrogating him, sort of law and order style, so kind of conventional police work. They want to, if he's guilty of something, they want to be able to prosecute a case in court, so they're not going to waterboard him or do anything that would be inadmissible. They try to build a relationship with him. Then the CIA shows up 
And they say, we'll take it from here. They um, put a hood on him and, and uh, duct tape his wrists and put him on a plane to Egypt, where he is taken to um, the, basically the extraordinary rendition czar of Egypt, the intelligence chief of Egypt at the time, a guy named Omar Suleiman. So he's put in the, under the, in the custody of the spy master of, of the Egyptian government and basically thrown into a dungeon in Cairo um, where other people are being tortured uh, and held without charges and disappeared, that kind of thing. And his interrogators come to his cell and they say, um, we're going to come back to you in a few minutes for your interrogation. And the subject of that discussion will be Saddam Hussein's links to Al-Qaeda. So you better have something. So they come back, and guess what he tells them? Saddam Hussein works with Al-Qaeda. This, like Curveball's testimony, is immediately doubted by U.S. intelligence professionals, and Ibn Sheikh Alibi um, subsequently recants, much like Curveball. He says he made it up to avoid torture. Uh, and uh, Although in Ibn Sheikh Libi's case, unfortunately, we'll not be hearing more of his story. He was subsequently passed from Egyptian custody to Libyan custody. He's an, uh, he was a Libyan national. A Libi means in Arabic Libyan. And he, uh, this was Libya under Muammar Gaddafi. Uh, and in one of Muammar Gaddafi's dungeons, uh, a Libi was killed, or the official report was that he committed suicide. So we have this guy who comes up with, under duress, under a threat of torture, fabricates um, a link between Saddam Hussein and al-Qaeda, and then is whisked off to Libya, where he is um, covertly executed, basically by the Qaddafi regime. Uh, so these, these were the building blocks for, um, for the case. And I, I guess the final, final thing I'll say here is, it's not so much that um, they were hypocrites, that like Dick Cheney or Bush thought, um, yeah, we've got we've to make things up. Like, they may have genuinely thought. Like, I've, I've looked at Cheney's memoirs, and I, you know, I, I've followed, I've read stuff by neoconservatives like Paul Wolfowitz. You know, they, they may genuinely think, okay, Saddam Hussein someday is going to attack the United States, or we just can't, uh, well, Dick Cheney's favorite line was the risks of inaction are worse than, are, are greater than, the risks of inaction are greater than the, the risks of action. Um, they may genuinely think that. Um, you know, I'll never know what's you know, going on inside their, inside their heads. But in terms of the evidence, they were, they were fundamentally wrong. And in terms of the way that foreign policy in a country that likes to tout itself as one of the world's oldest democracies ought to be run, um, it, it's, it strikes me that the, the substantial costs of these wars of choice, which may be diffuse but are very real for those who experience them and will be very real in terms of national uh, economic priorities as this country moves forward, um, argues for... Uh, Making a more evidence-based case in public and actual instead of um, concocting um, a case and relying on uh, on flimsy evidence, um, just because some in this foreign policy elite feel uh, kind of especially threatened and and, and worried. So yeah, um, really interested in yeah your questions and discussions. So. So use the mic if you want to ask a question. And we, we have to stay here for 30 minutes. So if you don't ask questions, it's going to get really boring. Can you use the mic? Or do you want somebody to pass them around? Which, which is better? Well, since you're there, just go ahead and use it. But I'm thinking, because we have that one there, too. Having never really heard all, about all this in detail, I mean, of course, I knew all this was going on, but I've never really heard the details of why we did it, or how many people died. It's very upsetting to me to think that without a real purpose, the U.S. would continually intervene in the Middle East, spending 
trillions of dollars that could be better used in our country, injuring and killing civilians in those countries for no real gain. So what would happen if we just ignored these, I mean, let them live their life. Get out, forget about them. What happens if we just don't do anything at all? And I mean, you're saying that we're the safest country, and we are. I don't live in fear of anybody bombing me. Um, so if we did that, and they did get more powerful, we're already powerful. That doesn't mean we have to deplete our resources. I really think that we could prevail. And I, and I feel like these countries are never going to attack us to start with. So why don't we just, yeah, I mean, what would happen? I guess my question is, what would happen if we just stopped and leave them alone to run their own countries and live their life? Yeah, yeah, well, I think what, uh, you know, one can't predict, predict the future, but I would hope that someday our relations with countries in the Middle East will be a lot more like our relations today with countries in Central America and Latin America, which is to say, um, overall, much healthier, much more on a, a basis of respecting other countries' sovereignty, uh, dealing with them in terms of trade, letting them pick their own governments, um, that kind of thing. I think right now, in terms of the Middle East policy, there are, there are regular, even though presidents love to say all options are on the table when they're threatening force, all options on the table actually means diplomacy. And there are examples, even under Bush and Obama, of the U.S. not pursuing regime change and, and not choosing war. I think U.S. relations with Iran up until this point have been a, a, you know, a provisional, in, encouraging example of the U.S. Uh, engaging with a country that many people in the Bush administration wanted to wanted to fight. Um, you know, we'll see what happens under Trump. Right now, Trump is very has a very adversarial stance toward Iran. But I think what Obama was able to do in terms of the nuclear deal with Iran, uh, uh, involving other countries as well, is a great example of the alternative that on, that's on the table. The alternative is not is not isolation. I don't. We don't call you know Norway isolationist. We don't call countries that engage around the world through humanitarian assistance, trade deals, savvy diplomacy, isolationist. The alternative is um, smart diplomacy that keeps in mind the other ways of using our resources at home while avoiding unnecessary loss of life. Also, since you mentioned Norway, one of the interesting things about Norway is it gives away 1% of its GDP in, in foreign aid. Yeah. We give away 0.1% of our GDP in foreign aid. And, you know, in, in the end of the day, almost all of our foreign aid is earmarked for weapons purchases. So, like, Egypt and Israel and Colombia get the, uh, the, more than one-third of the entire foreign aid package, just those three states, and Pakistan, uh, um, and w those four states. And almost all of it is spent buying our tanks and our helicopters and our, and our equipment. And so, you know, in the case of Egypt, which gets $1.5 billion a year, that, that's actually a burden on their economy because now they got this super bloated military they have one of the largest tank armies on Earth, and they've got to sustain it. Um, so I think, you know, to your, to your question, Norway is spending 1% of their GDP, and they have a fantastic economy, great relations with the world. Their money is specifically designated not to be used for military purposes, so it goes into developing the state that they're then going to trade with. And so in the long term, not only are they generating more goodwill, but they're actually stabilizing the world, even though they're tiny compared to us. Um, one of the things that happened with the United States is, well, one of the problems that we have is we, we, have, we have these regime changes in the United States. Every four to eight years, we have a new commander at the head, and so the policies keep changing. So in the aftermath of World War II, I'm not, I'm not really sure why Truman decided to do this, but in 1949, he decided to overthrow the fledgling democracy in Syria, and so the CIA went in there and did this coup d'etat. In 19... Um, 53, Eisenhower decides to take out uh, Iran's fledgling democracy. It's the second time Iran is trying to move towards democracy. Um, and then the Eisenhower administration decides that the biggest threat it's facing in the Middle East is not the rise of communism, 
It's actually the rise of pan-Arab secular socialism that was being promoted by Gamal Abdel Nasser. And so what the, what, the, what the United States ends up doing under the Eisenhower administration is funding everybody that you would never think you would want to fund in an effort to, to sort of derail and upset uh, the possibility of Nasser succeeding, including ultimately in 1958, invading Lebanon, threatening to nuke Iraq. I mean, we, we under Eisenhower, we end up creating this, this crazy storm of chaos in 1958. And it looks, it, from, from now, this perspective now, looking back at it, it, you know, it looks like a precursor to what we end up doing under the Bush administration and then the Clinton administration and the Bush administration, where it's just this generating more chaos. Interestingly enough, and I think this is what I really want to get to is, you know, it's the question of what would happen if, right? We don't really know. But interestingly enough, what Nasser had proposed for the Middle East was a, a state that would go from Iraq to Morocco that probably wouldn't look too much different than the European Union does today. Now, whether the Arabs could have pulled off that kind of unity or not, is that, that's totally in doubt, obviously. But, but would it be so horrible right now if we had this secular European Union-style confederacy that stretched across the Middle East that would be a trading partner? And, and you know, like, if, if Nasser could have pulled it off, that sounds to me like a damn good situation compared to what we have today. Um, so I think there was the short-sightedness of the Eisenhower administration, but then all of a sudden, you know, you have, you have Kennedy and then LBJ and then Nixon. So there's no cohesion between it. And, and so it, even if Eisenhower had some grandiose long-term plan, it doesn't, it doesn't get translated across these different regimes. And of course, Junior, right, I mean, he, he, nobody, I think, would, would, would try to argue that Junior had uh, an understanding of the Middle East. I mean, the Bremer, the guy who puts in charge of Iraq, the guy did nothing. He didn't know, he'd never even been to the Middle East. Like, next thing you know, he's suddenly the Iraqi president trying to put things together. And his first order is to stop the looting by shooting everybody. And the military is like, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> You're going to shoot them? This is a bad idea. This is going to set a really nasty tone. And, you know, and, and so there, there, it just seems... Looking at it from my perspective, we look like we're insane. We look like we don't have anything consistent. There's no glue holding us together. Um, we, we jump from thing to thing. Uh, so I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe Latin America, I think, is really happy that we haven't invaded in a long time. You know, uh, We invaded Nicaragua seven times and Honduras eight times since 1890. And I think they're just thrilled that we haven't been there recently. Okay, so my question, well, I had a few because this lovely paper. Um, so when you were first talking, you were saying that when they take polls, um, the elite more drastically, I guess you could say, vote um, brutality and like going in and invading and doing stuff like that, whereas like common folk would rather be less invasive and less hands-on, I guess you could call it. Um, do you think this is because the elites um, kind of have that power to not be so personally involved in it, and also because, like, the common folk don't necessarily involve themselves entirely with what's going on politically, so they wouldn't know the repercussions of doing that. Yeah, the, so the polls show that uh, the American public generally fav favors security of well-being sort of basic material material security. So that means like infrastructure, nation building at home kind of stuff. Um, they are not so concerned about like coming to Saudi Arabia's aid if it gets attacked or coming to Israel's aid if it gets attacked or even for that matter, coming even coming to like South Korea's aid if it gets attacked. I mean, actually numbers are very low among Americans if you ask them, would you, do you think the US should take military action if North Korea invades South Korea? Uh, which would, might be a surprise at the Pentagon because um, there are tens of thousands of troops in South Korea. Um, so there's just a yeah a fundamental difference in priority, and I think to a great extent it comes down to what are the career paths for these for the foreign policy elites and politicians in general versus the career paths for everybody else. Hillary Clinton had captured some of this when she once said about her support, her very strong advocacy for intervening in Libya in 2011, 
Um, she would rather be caught trying than caught like not trying. So it's sort of a damned if I do or damned if I don't. I'd rather be damned if I do. Uh, she supported the Iraq War uh, resolution in 2002, uh, which came back to, to hurt her in the primary against Obama in 2008. Anyway, and then she supported the Libya intervention. Generally speaking, and, oh, and why, why did she do that? Why, and why did many other Democrats support the Iraq War uh, resolution in 2002? In 1990, 1991, there were very few Democrats who were in favor of Bush's uh, Bush's war in Iraq, uh, in Kuwait. But there were enough that even when Democrats were in control of the Senate back then, that uh, there, enough crossed over that they gave Bush an, a narrow majority. This is Bush 41, Bush the father. Those who didn't um, face tough re-election campaigns, whether it was in 92 or 94, um, Al Gore, by the way, um, did support that Iraq war. Anyway, the lesson for Democrats was better, be caught, better to be caught trying than not trying. Better to be caught supporting an intervention um, ahead of time. Because if, if it goes well, like 1991, which didn't turn out to be like Vietnam, everyone was worried it was going to be a quagmire. It, it wasn't, because the, the goals were very limited. You just kick Saddam Hussein's army out of Kuwait, you don't go in and occupy Iraq. You don't go to Baghdad. You don't overthrow Saddam Hussein. Um, so they, the, the ones who opposed that war resolution um, looked like they were soft on national security or they had been soft on Saddam Hussein. They had been naive. They had been appeasing this guy who was like Hitler. And so they faced tough re-election campaigns, and many of them lost office, um, including a, a leader in the Democrats, Sam Nunn from Georgia. By contrast, so many Democrats um, in 2002 supported the Iraq War, and although there are some cases like um, Hillary Clinton losing to Obama in the primary, in most cases they did not pay a political price. They were with the overwhelming majority of the political establishment. Um, so all of that is a really long-winded answer to your question of saying, in terms of career paths, the average American answering a public opinion poll can say, like, yeah, that's a dumb idea. We shouldn't, we shouldn't come to this country's aid. We shouldn't randomly get involved in military interventions. Uh, and we should definitely pursue diplomacy and save our money for you know, fixing bridges so they don't collapse on people. And uh, whereas the politician, the foreign policy elites are like, yeah, I'm going to support the intervention. I want to go along with the herd. I want to be, you know, I don't want to be the outlier if this intervention goes spectacularly well. I don't want someone to run against me in a campaign and say I'm, I'm weak when it comes to military options or I'm not you know, bold enough to use force. So I think that's it. I think there's, a, there's a, a, a perverse incentive structure for those in the foreign policy establishment. Um, you know, the closer they get into Washington or working their way up in Washington, that inclines them to support uh, adversarial options over reasonable diplomatic engagement. Okay, and then second question for both of you is, should we be trying to, in a sense, rebuild, or should we be trying to strengthen them and help them, or should we just leave them alone, kind of as she was saying? Like, should we have an incentive to kind of help them, like, uh, economically and as, long, as far as, like, I guess, helping, gosh, the words, like, make it more viable to live there, essentially. It's, uh, so there, there's this thing that I think we think is, that's really strange, is that we're somehow in this peculiarly strange place of we understand what democracy is, we know how to run economies, that somehow this, this civilization, like, there's evidence that the Egyptian civilization really started about 6,500 years ago, that somehow we, with our 240 years, are going to show them how to make this work. Um, the, if you took the Arab world, so dropping the Turks and the Persians out of the equation, and you, and you did put them together in a state like Nasser had suggested, 
It would be the second largest state on earth in terms of land. It would be the third largest in terms of population. It would have a population of about 460 million people. It would be bigger than the United States significantly. It would uh, have about 37% the size of the United States' GDP. So per capita, our GDP is significantly higher. But that's a huge, huge GDP. We're not talking about extraordinarily poor countries. It's not like we're talking about um, South Sudan or, right, because it's je jettisoned itself out of the Sudan. Uh, we're not talking about fourth world countries. We're talking about states like Egypt, which has an enormous level of development. We're talking about extremely oil rich states. I think if we just left them alone and, they're, and they sort of began trading with themselves and trading outside, that they're, they don't need our help. That, that, that's sort of this false narrative of the white savior coming in and, and, and making this work. Uh, we're talking about a huge chunk of the world's economy. Um, it, it'd be about 6% of the world's population, I think, and about 4% uh, of the world's GDP. So they, they'd be just fine. I think, in, the, in effect, suggesting that we would somehow help Iraq would be kind of like having, in a, in a relationship where one partner battered the other one, having that one then administer first aid. Like, it's, it's a little inappropriate at that point. I think we should bring in the police, have that guy arrested, and then have a hospital administer first aid. Um, so that, that's my answer to that. Yeah I, yeah, I would totally agree with that and say um, generally the principle would be help other countries as you would want them to help you. So we wouldn't like it if um, you know, countries from Scandinavia came over here and militarily occupied us to impose uh, meaningful universal health care. <laughs> I mean, I, I might like the outcome, but I would reject the military occupation. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, you know, so uh, and and so you know, if you, the the tougher versions of your question would be like, what about the Taliban in Afghanistan? The Taliban—they're stopping girls from going to school. They're imposing the burqa. Da 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 da. What about the Taliban? Should they just be allowed to run? Well, you know what? Um, it's ultimately going to be up to Afghans to decide how much power the Taliban has. And when it comes to the rights of women and children and other vulnerable populations. War is one of the worst things that can happen to them. The U.S. war in Afghanistan has not helped, uh, it's not been a net improvement for the state of women or other Afghans. And in fact, and the Taliban remains very much a political force, and eventually the only way that Afghan civil war is going to end is with some type of political settlement that includes the Taliban. And the longer that day is, is uh, kind of postponed, I think the more unnecessary loss of life will occur. So, but that's just, that would be the basic gold rule, is like, don't, yeah, don't come in with the presumption that you have better ideas um, or any type of right. I mean, and military occupiers do not have rights, they have responsibilities. The U.S. has responsibilities that it um, is not, has not upheld with Iraq and it has not upheld with other countries that it has militarily occupied or undermined through war. There's um, a judgment against the United States for the, the mines um, in the harbor in Nicaragua. That we, I mean, we still owe Nicaragua money. We owe reparations to Vietnamese. Where, I mean, there's all kinds of ways in which if the U.S. if U.S. officials, U.S. leaders were, were serious about kind of their moral culpability, the tally from these wars would be you know, way beyond the four trillion that I mentioned. Uh, and actually to add to that, to sort of piggyback on that, so the first thing that comes to my mind is how would you feel like if we, if we bombed everything from Chicago to Detroit and then brought in the United States Marine Corps and, and sort of restored order? Like, does that sound like that would make Detroit better? Like, how, would Flint's drinking water problem be solved? Um, and, and another thing, though, is to piggyback on this women's rights thing. You know, that was one of the things that I kept hearing was we'll improve women's rights in Iraq. So when we attacked Iraq, 2% uh, of the U.S. Congress was women, the House and Senate. In Iraq's parliament, 34% of its parliament was women. Now, you can say, well, the parliament was a rubber stamp parliament. Yeah, but nonetheless, that sort of tells you something about that society. Women were in the workforce. W women in Iraq had enormous influence on the economy in ways that I think challenge most of our stereotypes. 
Today, women are 5% of Iraq's parliament. And again, you can make the same argument, Iraq's parliament's worthless, and it is. But, you know, 5% from 34%, that's a symbolically significant. I think we're, still, we're only at 17% of our Congress as women. So, you know, like, oh, you're, you're throwing this woman's issue thing at a state where, when you start to look at the numbers, they're not necessarily as backwards as you think. They are now, because we've set women's rights back dramatically. Um, one stat that we haven't thrown out there is the death, the death toll. I did say the 800,000 from the Clinton administration, probably 80,000 80, from the first war. The second war, Johns Hopkins says it's about 1.2 to 2 million. Um, but there's a stat that I think is really telling that, that sort of runs across the 20 years of conflict with Iraq that we conducted, is at the end when the United States withdrew, 21 years, when the United States withdrew, um, there were five million Iraqi orphans in a country of 30 million people. So one out, literally one out of six people was an orphan. Well, I happen to know the for, fertility rate for Iraqi women, it's five. So one out, that five million means one million dead mothers, and then, by contrast, one million dead fathers. And that's just looking at one, one statistical vector here. That's just two million dead right there. That doesn't even take into consideration all the dead children or all the children who had one parent die and not both parents die, right? I mean, so we're talking about a really, really catastrophic event for a country of only 30 million people. It probably lost around 10% of its population and had a, at one point 50% of its population displaced. Yeah, I mean, unless, you, unless you're Raytheon and General Dynamics and Lockheed Martin. I mean, that $3 trillion that we spent on Iraq, that went somewhere. <laughs> Halliburton. Um, all, right. all right, so it's kind of a piggyback to what she said, because we're on the same wavelength genetically. But just as a comment about what you just said, uh, Raytheon and General Dynamics, both that my father spent the majority of his career with. If it wasn't for them, we might not have food on our table. So, um, but uh, I think there's definitely, how much do you think ego plays into what we do? Because I think that when it comes to, especially the Bush thing and um, stuff like that, I think there's a need for us to, when she said, just leave them alone, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, I think there's a need for us to kind of flex our muscles to show people that, you know, we're, we mean business. When in reality, if you just kind of, you know, leave them, al leave them alone, you know, it's kind of, you know, kind of you're more powerful if you're silent. I think there, but I think there's definitely a, you know, we kind of feel like we need to flex our muscles and show people that we mean business and stuff. And as much as um, Trump's ratings are in the toilet right now, um, I think that part of, I, you know, I could be completely wrong, it's happened many times, but part of what I think's going on right now is maybe he's more focused on what's in front of us. Because it's much easier to look to, work on somebody else or working somebody else's problems and helping them than to help yourself. And I think we need to definitely go into a period where unless somebody's an imminent threat to us, you know, we have plenty of problems in this country as it is. And as um, Dr. Casagranda loves to tell us on a daily basis, the world is burning around us. And so... Well, I think on your, I mean, your first mention that your family, kind of your uh, family income is linked to Raytheon uh, General Dynamics is a really important point. I mean, since World War II, there has been a kind of implicit bargain between the U.S. government and the U.S. public, which is that um, we're going to become the biggest economy in the world, basically. Okay, right now it's kind of neck and neck with China, but basically biggest economy in the world. But one cost of this is that this economy, part of it, will depend on, kind of like in a symbiotic relationship, will depend upon us getting into wars and having like a big war machine. And it's 
But that is actually, uh, that's called military Keynesianism. You're basically creating jobs through, um, the Pen it's a jobs program basically through the Pentagon. Um, but that, I mean the irony is, you know, Republicans and conservative economists will tell you um, that is not an efficient job creator. <laughs> like you, if you put that money into um, other industries, more like more productive industries, you would get a lot of knock-on um, benefits that you don't get with military Keynesianism. So one example of this military Keynesianism is when you have congressmen lobbying to get more tanks built in their districts, even as the military, the Pentagon is saying, we don't need more tanks. You can look at, The Daily Show did a great um, segment on this um, is, uh, many years ago. It's called um, Tanks But No Tanks. Uh, with Al Madrigal as the correspondent. And yeah, it's like, we don't need more tanks. We, tank, is, tank warfare is a low probability event, one of the guys says in a second. But Congress is like writing these letters, like forcing the military, forcing the Pentagon to buy uh, tanks or other weapon systems that are very expensive and bring money to companies like General Dynamic. But if uh, there would be other ways of spending that money that would be just as productive for the US economy. And in the long run, it's gonna be a loser because if you think about the US economy competing with other countries, competing with the European Union, competing with China, countries that are not engaged in such crazy military Keynesianism, we're gonna get, um, get left behind and we'll have more crumbling bridges and other kind of basic um, system failures that you wouldn't expect in an advanced industrialized uh, country. Now, with respect to ego, well, I'll, I'll stop for a second. No, do, do the ego. Yeah, so with respect to ego, there is a lot of, um, so here's the way I, I, I kind of try to look at things. Like, I, people have belief systems that may not be based on evidence, and those belief systems can be very consequential. Uh, so I may not agree with them, and I could say, look, here's, here's, here are the facts, but if they believe them, then it, you know, it matters for policy. So an example in the Vietnam era was domino theory. So you know, Vietnam becomes communist, then Thailand's gonna become communist, and then all these other countries in uh, Southeast Asia will become communist, and eventually it will spread to the United States. And this, this is a, a very pervasive way of looking at uh, military decisions uh, in this country, and it was there in, in the Cold War, and it's still with us today. So a few months ago when there was, last year when there was that story about the US soldier getting killed in Niger, people were asking, why do we have soldiers in Niger? Like we couldn't even locate it on the map. And this guy from the New York Times on NPR is like, well, you know, if ISIS is in Niger, then they could go to Libya, and then they could get across to Europe, and then they could cross the Atlantic. <laughs> And it's like, yeah, it's just, I mean, it's like this, like, it's not, it's not ego in this sense, but it does get at your point about ego, because there's just things that go on in people's mind. They have these little shortcuts and ways of interpreting the world that are very reductive and simplistic, and yet they're the stuff of, like, New York Times op-ed columns. They're in, these are people who are, like, in the room when it happens, when the major decisions are being made, and, and these ideas have, um, have an impact. Um, another example, also from a New York Times journalist, was a discussion about Syria. I, I mean, I love listening to NPR shows where people call in because that's when you get a glimmer of public attitudes out there. Like, people saying, like, why are we in Syria? Like, or why do we care about Syria? Like, just let Russia have Syria. That's, that's what somebody said on NPR. Like, just, why do we care? If, it's like ego, right? Uh, um, just let Putin do what he wants in Syria. And the New York Times column said, well, Syria is, and the, the host said, well, okay, so yeah, Mark Mazzetti, New York Times, why should we be in Syria? Why don't we just, like, just leave it to Russia and Bashar al-Assad? He said, well, Tom, you know, Syria is a very strategically important country in the middle of this strategically important region of the Middle East. <laughs> it's just like circular logic all over the place. <laughs> I mean, like, you know, anytime someone says strategically important, um, what do you mean by that? Like, it's like Vietnam. It's strategically important in your, it's more like psychologically important for the person who's using the word strategy. So. The, I think the ego thing is important, um, in, in part because I think Americans really, at some level, 
buy the myth that we're a democracy, which is obviously not true. Um, and then we, we sort of buy this idea that we have, you know, we can use this economic power to make the world a better place, or our military power. Um, but I'm going to do an anecdotal thing, just because I, and I'll take it out of the United States. Maybe that'll make it feel a little less personal. So when Czechoslovakia was overthrowing the communist government in 89 and 90, a friend of mine and the two of us decided to go. We wanted to, to be a part of this. And, you know, there was this period of time where we were there in Czechoslovakia, will they Tiananmen Square us? And, it, and of course, it turned out that, no, the, the communist state was gone. It just nobody knew it was gone. Um, but so I'm in this restaurant eating eggs, and there's this guy sitting next to a, my friend. I mean, he was maybe in his 50s, and uh, he's, he, he turned out he was Austrian. He starts talking to us, and he goes, why are you here? And you know, I said, well, it's a revolution. I just wanted to see what it looked like from the inside. And he said, oh, I'm here because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help teach the Czechs democracy. And I, I'm like, wow, I didn't, I don't say this out loud, but my thought was, I didn't know Austria was this bastion of democracy that, that it, you could <laughs> export democracy to, to Czechoslovakia, which obviously doesn't exist anymore. It's now the Czech Republic and Slovakia. But um, I, I found the guy just so unbelievably arrogant, like, you know, I was there because I wanted to show support for the Czechs, but I, I couldn't imagine telling them what to do next. It just was beyond the, the pale of what I could have imagined a person would do in that circumstance. Whereas here's this guy saying, you know, oh, I'm going to show you. And I, and, I, and I think that American arrogance really runs deep to the point where, you know, we discount the fact that the civilization that we're in was founded by, by the Iraqis and the Egyptians, these people that we look down on and, and think can't manage things. They founded our civilization. I mean, they, they, it's just insane that we're, we're, not, we're not even the kid. We're like the great, 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 great grandson trying to tell granddad what to do. It's, that takes a ton of arrogance, I think. So I think there's something there. I, we don't have any more time, but I want to plug Jason's book. You're get, you're, you, well, I want That's you to plug it, because it's not done yet. No, it's not done. But, but it will years. be, and so they, they need to know to go get it. A couple it. years away. Oh, yeah. is it that far away? Yeah. yeah oh, academic well, processes. <laughs> a year and a half, maybe. year and a half? Maybe we can do an event. When it, oh, yeah, absolutely. Out. We'll yeah. bring you back. Do you don't want to give like a oh, no, tentative sure, title? Sure. Yeah, it's called, um, right now it's called Dumb Wars, <laughs> America's Interventions in the Middle East. And uh, it's looking at Iraq and sort of the, the difference under Bush about invading Iraq, but then not invading Iran. And then the difference under Obama between uh, fighting a regime change war in Libya, but not fighting a regime change war in Syria. And it very much gets at these issues of kind of what's going on at the elite level, what happens, what's been happening in public opinion, and how people could be more aware of that. I mean, there is, we should not expect these elites to somehow self-correct or learn from history. They instead tend to reproduce their thought patterns in their own kind of uh, beltway culture. And um, uh, yeah, and that's, the, and, and kind of helping people to think about like how can we, how can we make sure diplomacy is more actually on the table. Cool, yeah, yeah. all right, thanks. And you can feel free to come up and talk to us a little bit more, I suspect. Would you yeah, stick yeah, around a little bit? Yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> you don't have to. <laughs>